hppodcraft.com. The fortunes of war favored Hrothgar. Friends and kinsmen flocked to his ranks, young followers, a force that grew to be a mighty army. So his mind turned to hall building. He handed down orders for men to work on a great mead hall, meant to be a wonder of the world forever. It would be his throne room, and there he would dispense his God-given goods to young and old. And soon it stood there, finished and ready, in full view, the Hall of Halls. Heorot was the name he had settled on it, whose utterance was law. Then a powerful demon, a prowler through the dark, nursed a hard grievance. It harrowed him to hear the din of the loud banquet every day in the hall, the harp being struck, and the clear song of a skilled poet telling with mastery of man's beginnings. Grendel was the name of this grim demon, haunting the marches, marauding round the heath and the desolate fens. He had dwelt for a time in misery among the banished monsters, Cain's clan, whom the Creator had outlawed and condemned as outcasts. For the killing of Abel, the Eternal Lord had exacted a price. Cain got no good from committing that murder, because the Almighty made him anathema, And out of the curse of his exile there sprang ogres and elves and evil phantoms, and the giants too, who strove with God time and again until he gave them their final reward. So, after nightfall, Grendel set out for the lofty house to see how the Ring Danes were settling into it after their drink. And there he came upon them, a company of the best asleep from their feasting, insensible to pain and human sorrow. Those were some selections from the opening of Beowulf, the Seamus Heaney translation. And we are talking about it here on the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. At hppodcraft.com, I'm Chris Lackey. And I'm Chad Pfeiffer. Who was doing the reading at the top? Like, you gotta ask? I do. Andrew Lehman! Thought I recognized that voice. Grendel probably wouldn't have been so mad if it was Andrew Lehman that he heard in that hall reading those poems. (laughs) The whole conflict could have been avoided. Yeah. It would have been great. But then we wouldn't have the story. No. So I want to thank Andrew for reading on this show, but also for not reading poetry in the fictional universe of Beowulf. (laughs) If you really think about it, he's the one who gave us this by not doing that. So thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. (laughs) For this great literature. We also have brought Reber Clark back to provide some music for us. Yeah. It's been a while. Reber is a wonderful, delightful human being, and we got to spend some time with him in Providence. And hopefully we will again this year. That creepy opening we heard was his music, and uh, we'll hear more of his music throughout the show. As always, we'll link out to it in our notes. In fact, since this is Beowulf, why don't we kick this discussion off with a big epic theme? Reber, let's hear it. Ah, there you go. So epic. I feel like I'm the hero. I feel like I should give you treasure. Give me treasure. <laughs> lots and lots of treasure. You know, if you play this theme music, it's very heroic and mm-hmm. inspiring. But if you play it over anything mundane, it becomes instantly hilarious. <laughs> like, look at a picture of your grandma and play this music. Bunch of cats. Anything like that. It's great. I might just, in the show notes, link out to just this theme so people can maybe tie it up with some different images. That's a great idea. Different videos and send them to us and, and see what you come up with. I must see that. You know, <laughs> typically on this show, we draw from H.P. Lovecraft's essay, Supernatural Horn Literature, to help frame our discussion on the stories that we cover. In that essay, Lovecraft wrote that Beowulf was full of eldritch weirdness. And that's that's it. Yeah, that's about all he wrote about. I mean, he obviously <laughs> loved it. Yeah. And uh, you can see elements of what he wound up doing here in in the poem, but not so much help. So we thought we would get help from elsewhere this time. Yep. A while ago, we gave a call to Mr. Bob Hansky, who was my English teacher for two years in high school. Mm-hmm. He was the faculty advisor for the Renaissance Club, which was a literature club Chris and I started in school. Nerds. Because people thought we were too cool. Yeah. We had to come up with something and knock ourselves down. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> Mr. Hansky was also the director of a lot of high school plays that Chris and I were in. And it's actually when we started hanging out. Uh, yeah, we became friends in a production. Have we talked about this? In a production of Little Shop of Horrors. That he and his wife, Peggy, yeah. uh, were both working on. And they were mentors for both of us and, and close friends, too, as yeah. we were growing up. So let's hear a little bit of our of our call with Bob. Mr. Hansky, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Chad. It's nice to be on the show with both you and Chris. I have to admit, I don't remember doing Beowulf in class with you, but you taught it. 
in school, right? Well, I taught Beowulf, but not to you. I didn't okay. teach Beowulf until I took over the senior level of the critical thinking program at United Township High School. Okay. That interdisciplinary, uh, team-taught approach with seminar discussion groups to literature and uh, history for two hours a day for sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And I taught yeah. the sophomore level to you, Chad, but then a few years later, I took over the senior level, too, and I taught both levels for about five or six years, and I taught Beowulf at the senior level, which was neat because it was the first time I'd revisited it since I'd read it in college, I think, and I took a course in Old English or something like that. Okay, let's just stop there. Uh, first, I wanted to say that the critical thinking program that Mr. Hansky was talking about that, that I went through in high school was fantastic. Yeah. I, I mean, to get that kind of education in a public school system is really rare. We spent most of our time in that class having small discussion groups with each other, discussing history and literature, and it's interesting that that's almost what my vocation has become, you know, <laughs> you and I doing this. Yeah. A discussion group we try and include the world in. We, yeah, we do. That sounded ridiculous. No, that's not ridiculous. It's beautiful. <laughs> it is beautiful. Second, he was talking about reading this when he was in college. And Chris, you were able to talk to somebody from the college world as well. Yeah. Heck yeah. I wanted to get an expert instead of us just being a couple of amateur goofballs saying mm -hmm. a bunch of stuff. I went to the University of Leeds and had a wonderful conversation with a Beowulf expert, and I'll let her introduce herself. Okay, uh, my name's Catherine Butt. I teach here in the School of English at the University of Leeds. Boom, we've got experts. Wow. So thank you so much, Dr. Batt, for taking the time. And that'll be the crew for this podcast covering the epic poem Beowulf. Obviously, this is a pretty complex text. It's been uh, discussed for a very long time in multiple translations. This show cannot even begin to cover the breadth of scholarship on Beowulf. No. Or even really cover for everything that happens in the in the story. Yeah. So our grand thesis here is just to talk about it a little bit. And we'll give a bit of a synopsis, but we're going to be a little bit more light on that than we usually are. And hopefully our discussion here will inspire you to go have a read and, and talk about it with your friends and enemies. And what? <laughs> so I don't know why you're talking with your enemies, but it's a start. It's a start. And to get this thing started, let's ask Dr. Bat, what is Beowulf? What is Beowulf? Beowulf is a long narrative poem that includes heroes and monsters. It's a poem that seems to have been not quite composed by committee, but we don't know who wrote Beowulf. Our only surviving manuscript of Beowulf dates from around the year 1000, but it may have been written in 750. Mm -hmm. And what we, what we have in written form may be the contribution of several people. People are agreed that it must have its roots in an oral culture, but we don't really know where this where this poem originates. So that's what it is in a nutshell. So how does Beowulf kick off, briefly? You've got this clan called the Spear Danes, and we get the lineage of their kings down to this guy, Hrothgar, who was mentioned in our opening reading. Mm -hmm. He's done really well at war and made a bunch of money. Very important. Lots of treasure, really important. Treasure is something that this culture holds in high esteem. I guess many cultures actually hold it in high esteem. I think all cultures do, but this one, it's, <laughs> they talk about it a lot. <laughs> they really talk about it a lot. But Rothgar builds a grand mead hall called Herut Hall, which is not just a throne room, but a hangout for the powerful members of his clan. The problem with this is that the hall is built next to the dwelling of a monster called Grendel. Not that they knew this beforehand, but right. <laughs> they find out because Grendel hates them. He hates their parties. He hates the joy. He hates the fact that they've got divine gifts. He's not just a monster. He is a descendant of Cain, as in the biblical Cain who killed his brother Abel and was cursed to walk the earth by God. So right. all of Cain's descendants are cursed. Grendel is one of those. One night, Grendel has had enough and he attacks Hedot's Hall when everyone is in a booze-induced sleep. And he kills 30 men. Oh. And and takes their corpses away. King Hrothgar is humiliated by this. And this isn't a one-time thing. Grendel keeps coming back night after night and killing people at their parties. Which, by the way, why are you still going to these parties? <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, if I go to somebody's party and I am mildly uncomfortable, the chances are good that I'm not coming back. If 30 people got murdered... <laughs> <laughs> and the guy that did it got away scot-free. I would make other plans. Other plans. I would feel good about binging on Netflix that night, letting <laughs> everybody else have their fun. <laughs> Eventually, uh, Herod Hall is abandoned. Everyone has been killed or fled. For 12 years, Grendel rules the hall, but only by night because he doesn't come mm -hmm. out during the day. The story of Grendel's shenanigans spreads. Songs are sung about him. Nothing can stop Grendel. And he won't negotiate. He won't take ransoms or bribes or anything like that. He just kills everyone. And that's a big deal in medieval European culture because part of warfare 
and feuds is that you can pay off debts. Like you kill somebody or you, you, you know, it's like, well, I'll give you a bunch of money and then we're even. And, yeah. and that was cool because that was the code of behavior at the time. And if you refused to do this, you would seem crazy because why would anybody ever stop killing each other? You know, it's like you kill mm-hmm. my friend, then I'm going to kill you. And then I killed you. So then somebody's mad at me. Right. It would never end. So they think Grendel is not only just a monster, he's like crazy. You know, they would, yeah, he doesn't respond to the civil lawsuits that are being <laughs> brought against him. I exactly. mean, we still do that, you know, right? That's what sure. civil suits are. If you accidentally cause somebody's death. You might have to settle up with them whether you meant to do it or not. Now, if we just roll back for a second, you were talking about Grendel being a, a descendant of Cain mm-hmm. earlier. I think the first time I read Beowulf, I remember a little bit of Christian imagery in it, but this time I was really impressed by how much of it is actually in there. You had asked Mr. Hansky about this when we were talking. The whole origin of Grendel and his mother are that they're... Yeah, son of Cain, you know, and all that. Yeah. To me, I don't know if it's me, but it feels like it's kind of woven in to the story sort of as an after it is and i you know that's kind of my feeling too that the person whoever it was the monk or whatever that put it down on paper for the first time in the 800s or whenever it happened had this really great story and he christianized it because because it's it is it's kind of thrown in there you know you get the story going and then he has to say oh and thank the lord i did that or you know if the lord of everybody taught me to do that i think it's an old story that has that Christianity woven into it. And Dr. Bad had some of the same thoughts when you talked to her about it, and she brought it to an interesting conclusion. I suppose this is part of the the whole composite yeah. nature of the thing. Um, is it originally a pagan hero poem that has add-ons, or is it the case that this poem is meant to explicate Christian morality? Is it meant to be about um, putting a Christian perspective on a pagan scenario? I think that is perhaps not how to look at it because it seems to me that this isn't a poem although you have the uh, the poet talks about things being god's will you have beowulf and his warriors when they first arrive they give thanks to god for a safe passage i think that those references are part of a texture of a poem that isn't about explicating things but about trying to live with things as they are and things as they are are not morally black and white and easily quantifiable categorizable i thought that that was such an interesting notion if it if i'm understanding her correctly that mm-hmm. because beowulf is the product of oral tradition and a mixing of civilizations it reflects reality in certain ways better than the product of a single author might mm-hmm. the human race is a mixture of religion and superstition and cultural values that contradict one another all the time over time but also within a culture christianity and paganism are mixed up even now totally look at the holidays christmas and easter the things that you know nominally they are christian holidays but the things that we do to celebrate them are very pagan totally the christmas tree everything we do santa claus all that stuff that's not that's not in the bible anywhere Right. And if you had one specific author, they probably have a worldview and a viewpoint that comes across in what they write. But here, because of the number of people this is likely filtered through, Mm -hmm. you kind of get that inherent contradiction that that is in society. Absolutely. Across the sea from the Danes is Gaetland. Now, Gaetland. Some people say Geats, but I think it's Gaet is the way it's pronounced. The Gates. Gaetland was part of Sweden at the time. Now, there's also Swedes, not to get confused later, but the, the Gaets and the Swedes fight at one point, but they're all, they all live in Sweden. They just don't call it that at the time. Right, right. The most powerful warrior on earth is a follower of King Hilak. We don't get his name yet. So there's a little bit of a, of a build up here. We're like, oh, who's you mean this, this powerful warrior? This power, the most, no, no, not a powerful warrior, the most powerful warrior in the world. Yes. He's going to come to the Danes and fight. Grendel, because he's heard about this. He knows King Rothgar is in trouble. He wants to help him. Obviously, this is Beowulf, but we don't know it yet. It's all mysterious. It's that uh, when you introduce the hero and they're just in silhouette. He hasn't turned to the camera yet. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Beowulf and his and his guys get there. 14 men, they get there. They explain their attentions. The lookout, when he sees them, is very suspicious of what they're up to. Right. He sees the ship come up on shore. He meets them and says, you know, who are you? What's going on? This warrior, who's Beowulf, has to explain who he is, what he's doing, what his lineage is. And it's really interesting that they live in this culture where these words hold weight. Like that's, Mm -hmm. there's no ID. 
Like, there's just no way to check. There's no system set up to protect everybody. No. You're just a bunch of people out in the middle of nowhere, and then some strangers show up, and that's it. it you got to go, well, he seems like he's nice, you know? Or- yeah, well, there's also lineage, and I think that's why that's so important, because in a tribal society, you meet a stranger. Okay, they could kill me. Maybe I should kill them. Mm-hmm. I don't know. So let's sit down. You tell me who your family is, and I'll tell you who my family is. We'll see how far we go back. And, you know, if we can find that right link on Ancestry.com, then we won't kill each other. You know, (laughs) if we can get back far enough and, oh, you know this guy, I know him too, or that's my uncle, that's also your cousin, great. We're not going to kill each other. But if you can't find that common lineage, you're in trouble. It's trouble. And that is horrific. Like, what a horrible time to be living in that that's what you have to do to get by mm-hmm. and to deal with other people. The world was a lot scarier. <laughs> yeah. And I think that just that sequence really demonstrates that. Absolutely. That it gives Absolutely. us an insight into a world and a culture that no longer exists. Like, mm-hmm. we don't deal with things like that anymore. They say the right things and, yeah. and they manage to get access to the hall, which they're very impressed by. And then the warrior finally reveals his name. He's Beowulf. Yeah. Da, da, da. Awesome. Lots of formality. Again, this is all about that culture. Rothgar realizes that he knew Beowulf's father and had met Beowulf when he was a kid. So he agrees to give Beowulf audience. I think also he had done a favor to Beowulf's father. Yes. We find that out a little bit later. And so that's why it's okay for him to accept Beowulf's help. Yeah. It's really complicated because he's the king. He's responsible and he can't deal with this threat. It makes him look weak. But if it's a favor, repaying a favor that he did, then it's almost as if he did it. Exactly. Beowulf explains to Rothgar who he is and that he is awesome, that he is the best warrior ever. Still very formal, but there's some boasting going on, which is a big Mm -hmm. part of, again, of this culture. He asks Rothgar to give him the honor of purifying the hall. So again, he's giving the proper respect to the king. And then he says on top of that, I'm going to fight Grendel unarmed. He's going to fight, yeah, with no weapons. No weapons. King Hrothgar thinks this is all great, and so they decide to party. Yeah, they rock it out. Except one of Hrothgar's followers... This guy, Undfarth, he tries to knock Beowulf down a few pegs because Beowulf is just saying, I'm the most awesome guy that's ever lived. And so he says, hey, wait a minute. Are you that same Beowulf that was in that swimming contest and lost to that man, Brekka? (laughs) And Beowulf goes, well, that's not the whole story. Because when we were swimming, we were equally matched and we were also wearing armor and carrying swords so we can fight sea monsters. (laughs) Well, good thing that I did because a sea monster grabbed me and pulled me down and then I killed it. But of course, that slowed me down. On top of it, I had to kill eight more of those before I finished the race. And then he turns it on Unferth and he says, speaking of which, why haven't you killed Grendel yet? <laughs> I mean, I killed eight sea monsters so Brekka could finish the race. <laughs> what What are you up to? And, and that shuts him up, of course. Yeah. Unferth, though I like, he's a character who comes around to Beowulf's greatness, but is initially skeptical. Yeah. And in that way, he's one of the few characters who actually has a, has a change or an arc in the story. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he does. I think that's interesting. And also that he's the one that says, yeah, he's boasting, but how can we trust this guy? And that's a good question to ask. It is. At that point, one of the few female characters in the story shows up, Rothgar's wife, Queen mm-hmm. Walchtheo. She greets the warriors, offers them this goblet to drink, and she thanks Beowulf for coming. So that's all we get really from women in this. And it's a very male-dominated society, obviously. Yeah, she's the only female, the only human female. And of course, there's a second female character, but we'll talk about that. Yeah, well, and then there's an other mention of queens as well within the mm-hmm. story. But right. she's the only one that actually interacts with Beowulf. The party rages on into the night. They know Grendel's coming soon. So Rothgar and his wife, they take off. They go to bed. They go somewhere else. All the gates, they lay down. Beowulf lays down on the floor. He takes off his armor as well as his weapons. So they all try to sleep, but they know what's coming. Then, boom, the doors are busted in. It's Grendel. He grabs one of the Gaet warriors right away, just grabs him and rips him to shreds, just tears him apart. When I think of this scene, I always think of that Goya painting, Saturn devouring his son. Oh, That's right. what I imagine. <laughs> yeah. He moves on to Beowulf. Beowulf has been faking sleep this whole time. Mm-hmm. He grabs Grendel by the hand. And now Grendel is, this is the first time he's, run into somebody who's an actual obstacle. This is the strongest man he's ever faced. Yeah. And in fact, Beowulf wanted to fight him without weaponry because he believes and he wants to prove that he is Grendel's equal. Mm. Not only is he not afraid of him, but he is on equal footing with him in combat. And it's a good thing that he didn't use weapons because when the others try to stab Grendel, Mm -hmm. they find that it doesn't work. No blade on earth can harm him. He's got some kind of magic protection. Yeah. So then Beowulf gets Grendel in this crazy hold and starts bending his arm back. First it pops, then it cracks, then rip he pulls it right off <laughs> he just pulls the arm off Grendel's like yow he flees off into the night <laughs> yow I'm sure he didn't say yow in my uh, translation he says yow but he 
goes, oh, my arm is not there anymore. And it really hurts. And then he runs away. <laughs> Beowulf is... As one. <laughs> the next day, they uh, celebrate the victory. They also go out and track Grendel to make sure that he's dead. They find a trail mm-hmm. of blood that leads into uh, the marsh, which goes straight into the water. And they go, yeah, he's, he's probably dead. He, yeah. he ain't going to survive not having an arm. And the severed arm is an awesome trophy. Yeah, they've got a, a monster's arm, which is yeah. a great thing to have. It's kind of gross, but, yeah. uh, you know, I guess a different culture. They value dismembered arms. They do. So they go back and celebrate some more. Beowulf is honored. Rothgar's minstrels sing a popular song about Sigmund the Dragon Slayer and then apply some of the parts to Beowulf's deeds, you know, that's, mm-hmm. again, this whole very oral tradition. The king uh, finally shows up and says, Beowulf, good job. I think you are so awesome that I'm going to adopt you as my son. Yeah. I mean, he's got sons already, but, you right. know, you're just, you're going to be one of my other sons because you're so awesome. I wish people did that in our culture now. It'd be really nice to be adopted as an adult. I, I have, you know, family, but it would be nice just to say, yeah. you know, you're, you're a good guy. I'm going to adopt you. Yeah. I'm sorry. I thought I was fishing a little bit there. I thought you were going to adopt me. Whatever. <laughs> um, it's, it's, I've been playing a long game. <laughs> try, try, try and get into your family. <laughs> then there's a whole scene where King Hrothgar presents Beowulf with, with gifts. Oh as we gosh. said, gift, give, gift giving is very important in this culture. So important. Gives gifts of gold and treasure to the other gay out warriors. You know, this was something that Mr. Hansky talked about. I think the first thing that struck me was how Norse and Teutonic it was, as, as opposed to the southern myths of the, the Greeks and the Romans, you know, the Egyptians and the Assyrians. They have kind of a different, slightly different value system. I did teach the Iliad and the Odyssey to you. And, yes. uh, and the Iliad, the, the, you know, the prizes that the, the, that the men go for, the big prizes are women. Helen and at the end of the Trojan War when Telphibius in the play Trojan Women is given out the prizes. They're all women and this uh, daughters of uh, Priam and all that. And in the uh, the Beowulf tradition, uh, the kind of a more Norse tradition, it's the givers of rings and the givers of treasure and uh, uh, they get honor, but they don't really get women, you know, as far as that goes. This notion about the gift giving and the comparison to these Greek epics, as well as the treatment of women, I'm interested in all of that, but I wanted to know when we were having these conversations with our guests, what is an epic? An epic is a story of a national or a legendary hero that is lofty in tone and high in caliber. I like to think of epic in terms of work that Sarah Kay has done in a different context, where she points out that an epic is in many ways characterized by a gift economy rather than a capitalist money economy. And if you think of the way in which people give things to one another in that poem, you know, a talk, treasure, um, a sword, promise even. The thing about gift giving is that you can't quantify what you give in return. We're back to relations between people rather than people being reduced to monetary value. You call something an epic and you're setting up a series of expectations about things, about heroes and and so on. Beowulf is written in a poetic mode that draws on agreed ways of thinking about human relations. And then it uses that as a point of departure. And I think one way you can say that something's an epic is well, how many things did it influence? You know, how long has it been around? You know, how big is it? The party continues. There's even more gift giving going on. Mm -hmm. They hunker down eventually for some sleep. They're tired. Everything's fine. No more threats. Wrong. (sighs) Because Grendel never had moved out of his mom's basement. And she wants revenge. So she rolls up on her out hall in the middle of the night. She just starts killing folks. She grabs a corpse of one of the Danes, flees back to the marshes, and she takes the the arm that they had. Where's Beowulf, though? Yeah, but well, he wasn't in the hall at the time because he didn't have this kind of stuff to worry. He got upgraded from sleeping on the floor to the, you know, he has a fancy room now that he killed a monster. <laughs> when King Rothgar is super bummed because the body that she took was one of his good friends. So Rothgar mm-hmm. tells Beowulf that there's this strange, creepy lake a few miles away. Supposedly it's bottomless and at night it burns, <laughs> which is pretty crazy. So Rothgar thinks that the lake must be the place where Grendel's mother lives. So Beowulf swears to find Grendel's mother and kill her. Hrothgar, Beowulf, their followers ride out, tracking Grendel's mother across the moors, up the cliffs, into places where they have to walk single file along narrow ledges. Very fantasy novel kind of stuff. And finally they get to this lake. And on the ground, the severed head of Hrothgar's friend is there, so they know they're close. The lake itself is teeming with monsters and serpents. 
They sound a war horn and the monsters go into a frenzy. One of the Gaets shoots one of the sea monsters with an arrow. Other warriors stab it with spears, drag it out of the water. They can't believe what they're looking at. These monsters really get downplayed in this story. Like, they talk mm. a lot about Grendel's mom and Grendel, but there's just a bunch of freaking sea monsters. And of course, we don't really get a good description of what Grendel and his mother look like, which Dr. Bat is going to talk about in a second. But let's talk about what Beowulf does in this moment. Right. He dons his chainmail armor and a golden helmet, which is, again, kind of crazy because you're swimming. But as we know from the earlier story, armor and weapons, he doesn't have to be worried about being weighed down because he's that awesome of a swimmer. But Unferth, that jerk from before, the guy that was smack talking him, he lends Beowulf this ancient sword called Runting, which was mm -hmm. tempered in blood and has never lost in battle. So Beowulf goes, hey man, thanks. That's really cool that you did that. Beowulf jumps into the churning lake. It takes him most of the day to swim down there before he can get to the bottom. That's where Grendel's mother is. She grabs him. She tries to rip him apart, but luckily his armor protects him. She drags him down to her lair. And all the while, there's other sea monsters. They're tearing off his armor, attacking him. Yeah. When they get to the lair, she manages to get away from him. So he's kind of safe for a bit, gathering some strength. He does see her creeping around. He takes Unferth's sword and goes to chop off her head, but the sword doesn't work. It doesn't cut it. <sighs> Again. So he throws it aside. This curse with a sword thing is yeah. crazy. It drives me crazy. <laughs> Beowulf throws the sword aside and he fights Grendel's mother, mano a mano, bare yeah. hands. They tussle for a bit. Beowulf falls and he's stabbed with a knife. And he's like, what? And Grendel's mom's packing. She's got a knife yeah. on her. And he's like, wait a minute. We're doing this. No weapons. But anyway, he still has enough armor to protect him. Beowulf sees over on the side in, her, in this lair that there is this super huge sword from times of old. It's like mm -hmm. the time of the giants is what, what it says in the story. And he goes, mm, might as well give that a try. So he grabs it, rolls over, because it's a huge sword. It's like one of those yeah. ridiculous kind of anime swords that right. is <laughs> completely proportionally wrong, but he takes it because he's Beowulf. That works. He slices her neck, doesn't cut her head off, but it cuts a wound in her neck so big that all the blood gushes out and she dies. Mm -hmm. Beowulf looks around the lair and he finds Grendel's body. And to take further revenge, he cuts off Grendel's head and takes it with him as a trophy. All that blood coming up when they see it on the shore. And they think, oh, Beowulf is done for. This didn't work out. So Hrothgar and the Danes, they split, but the Gaots, they stay. He's their boy. Yeah. They're not going to give up yet. Below, Beowulf, I think the monster has acid blood. Yeah. Which eats through the sword. So that giant sword he had melts down. He's only got the hilt, which has all these nice jewels inlaid in it. There's a ton of treasure down there as well, but he doesn't grab it yet. He takes the jewel inlaid sword. He takes Grendel's head. He comes up to the surface. Hey, I'm okay. The gates are like, yeah, we knew it. You'd make it You're because you're Beowulf <laughs> and you're awesome. And they all go back to uh, Herod Hall. Rothgar is super stoked. He wants to hear about the battle. Beowulf passes the credit on to God. It's a pretty crazy scenario. The swimming contest in the armor and him going down there taking a day to swim down to the bottom of this lake. Yeah. He seems just like Superman or something. He's got... Yeah. I think a, a modern audience is used to seeing more flawed heroes. Yeah. He's just arrived completely heroic already. I mean, he just sort of shows up a fully formed badass. Oh, I yeah. wasn't sure. Yeah. Is that heroic? Uh, would you just... Even though Beowulf is the hero it's of this... Mythic, it's tale. mythically heroic, you know. I mean, it's, it's Hercules, you know, and things like that. The tremendous strength. That's the first and foremost thing is strength, especially to early peoples, you know, because that's what they could rely on because they didn't know when something stronger was going to come over the hill. And <laughs> for some reason, it's reminded me of the Mel Brooks 2,000-year-old man when he says, you know, we used to worship Phil, but then somebody stronger came along and, you know, Phil got struck by lightning and then we started to worship God, you know. So. <laughs> he was of all the kings upon the earth, the man most gracious and fair-minded, kindest to his people and keenest to win fame. He is said to be um, the mildest person. You know, and you think, how can a mild person be, you know, this, yeah. uh, this aggressive hero? Uh, that that idea of the hero having to balance within himself all those different requirements is something that makes the hero figure sort of compelling, isn't it? Yeah. Although in Beowulf, Grendel's mother is obviously a very powerful woman. Yeah, but you think about it, he's, she's maybe more powerful than Grendel even. But mm -hmm. when he goes down under the water and he kills her, he doesn't bring back her head, he brings back Grendel's head. You know, even though she might have been the toughest one to fight. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's a masculine poem, right. isn't it? It's sort of invested in boy things. Yeah. And you don't actually see, you don't see the people behind the scenes doing the, you know, who clears up after the fight with Grendel in the hall. The idea of uh, of um, the female characters, we're, we're back again to 
perhaps a rather more nuanced question about categorization, thinking about how these characters relate uh, one to another, thinking about how gift economy of the epic world, women themselves may be gifts. Um, but then women also have to negotiate and define gifts and remind people, as Wealthal reminds Beowulf, of his own responsibilities in accepting a gift. If you accept a gift, then you undertake silently, but you undertake by your action of accepting a gift um, not to violate the particular relationship that that gift silently represents. I was also curious about what are Grendel and his mother? Because in the final part of the poem, coming up, Beowulf faces a dragon. That I get. I know what dragons are. But the monsters are not really described. They are a classic example of monsters being not these completely alien things, but you know, your deepest fears are your deepest fears perhaps because there is something uncannily similar to you about them. Oh, so they are humanoid, and yet at the same time, as many critics have pointed out, it's not clear what they actually look like. Grendel and Grendel's mother are said to have claws, but they also have fingers. Grendel's mother has loathsome fingers. Um, um, are they scaly? Are they hairy? They are of the race of Cain, but they are also sub yeah. beings. They also exist underwater and over land. And I think this is another area where the poem is so fabulous on where things happen and the importance of those liminal spaces that seem to belong to neither one realm nor the other. The strange hall, this uh, subaquian hall that Grendel and Grendel's mother inhabits, this lair, is both a recognisable hall and yet a loathsome antithesis to the hall of Heorot, for example. So Grendel is humanoid, but not humanoid. I think these things are really important to foundation myths, yeah. this idea of human and something not quite human. So the, in the later medieval period, the story that people would know about the founding of Britain is that originally a princess called Albina arrives, which is where the name Albion comes from, um, with her sisters, and they interbreed with the giants already on the island. Then it's Brutus, who is, depending on which version you read, the grandson or the son of Aeneas, who comes to Britain and gives it its name Britain from Brutus and conquers these giants. So this idea of a land as being something that you take possession of from people who are like you but not like you is very deep in mythology. There are some who might say that sympathizing with either of these monsters is a more modern reading of the story mm -hmm. as well. But I don't think so. I think it's there in the poem. It is. I mean, anybody who's tried to sleep during a noisy party can certainly relate to Grendel. <laughs> and obviously you can relate to Grendel's mother because, you know, her son was killed. The dragon probably less so. He's a very typical dragon in that he just has this monstrous desire to hoard treasure. So right. let's get into that, our, our quote unquote third act. Yeah, now we move forward in time. 50 years in the future, we learn that Beowulf's king dies in battle. His son Hardred took over, but he was killed. So Beowulf is now the king, and he has been for almost all that 50 years. The inciting incident is that someone in his kingdom snuck into a dragon's cave and stole a goblet from its treasure hoard. Tolkien, I, I know we have talked about this, but Tolkien loved this story. He loved Beowulf. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, he translated it. He wrote lots of scholarship about it. Lord of the Rings borrows tons from this. Especially this scene with the dragon hoarding the gold. Yeah, exactly. The treasure he has because this guy a long time ago amassed it and kept it in this barrow where the dragon lives. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any descendants. He felt bad it wasn't going to be passed on. But the dragon found the stockpile and just moved in on it. So he stole this to begin with, the dragon. Mm -hmm. And he's not really causing any trouble. He's just happy to be down there rolling around in his treasure until yeah. this person stole the goblet. It's this whole treasure thing. Just being near treasure makes people happy. So the dragon notices that one bit of his treasure, this goblet, is gone. He goes outside and he just goes nuts and he starts burning the countryside, going around the barrow in wider and wider circles, burning it up, trying to find this thief. This goes on for days. This isn't just a one-time thing. He's killing uh, Gaetz and he's destroying land. He does this 
during the day, and then at night he goes back and sleeps. It even gets to the point that the dragon destroys Beowulf's throne room. Obviously, he's not there. But Beowulf goes, you know what? I must have done something to anger God because mm. this kind of thing wouldn't shouldn't happen to me. And he feels bad right. about it. It's not like he's angry at God. He's just like, oh, I've done something wrong. I better make this right. Beowulf certainly becomes a more human character in this section in that he's older. Mm-hmm. Also, we get a little bit of a flashback to find out how he became king. Right. It was after his king was killed, the queen offered him the throne because she wasn't sure about Hardred, the one who took over. Yeah, he was young. He might not be strong enough to lead. Beowulf says, you know what? I don't want to be king, but I'll be the regent and wait for Hardred to get a little stronger, grow up, be ready for this. But that was disastrous because a group of Swedes showed up and killed Hardred. And Beowulf, he went after them, right? Yeah. He went down and hunted the Swedes down that did that and took revenge. But he doesn't even crave power. No. He's just an honorable guy. And the only way he found power was by kind of getting pushed into it by circumstances. He's not a, he's not playing the Game of Thrones, right? No. <laughs> he doesn't he doesn't care about that kind of thing. No. He does care about killing this dragon, though. So he gets to business. He orders an iron shield. It's going to be a flame proof iron shield. Mm-hmm. I don't know where you where did he get that from? Yeah, Amazon. He's not afraid of a, of a stupid dragon, so he gets no. on Amazon, gets his flame retardant shield, uh, and he gets 11 warriors. They go out to find this dragon. You know, and they also find the thief and force him to join their little party. And you know what that means? That That is 12, 13 members of the party. Mm-hmm. Hobbit! It's the Hobbit. It's the Hobbit, and one of them's a thief. So basically, Lord of the Rings is just a ripoff. It's a total ripoff of Beowulf. They don't even bother reading <laughs> Don't see the movie. It's just if you if you're listening to this show, you pretty much know what Lord of the yeah. Rings is about. Done. Beowulf starts psyching up his buddies for the dragon kill. There's a lot of boasting in this section again. And he's saying, you know, if I can get my arms around this thing, I'm gonna fight it barehanded like I did Grendel. But I'm gonna bring a sword. Just in case. <laughs> Beowulf goes to the entrance of the of the barrow and just calls out the dragon. He's like, Hey, I'm here, come and get it. But the dragon doesn't even screw around, it just blows flame right out of the out of the entrance. But fortunately, Smart dragon. Beowulf has got a shield, so he's fine. And the dragon tries to get behind him to get him and kill him. So there's this, like this little fight going on. But Beowulf keeps him, you know, on the proper side of the shield. He even slashes the dragon at one point, which doesn't really do any damage, but it really makes him mad. Yeah, the sword didn't really help him out that much once again. So Beowulf has to retreat. He's, he's pretty embarrassed about the whole thing. But the dragon pursues, keeps blasting with fire. This is not a good start to the battle. No. Uh, ten of Beowulf's men just take off. Yeah. And only one remains, which is Wiglaf is what I call him. Or maybe it's Wiglaf. Wiglaf. And this guy, he remembers how well Beowulf treated him and his family. He is not going to desert Beowulf. No. Wiglaf goes to Beowulf's side and the dragon blasts the flame again, this time destroying Wiglaf's wooden shield because he wasn't mm-hmm. prepped. Beowulf helps him. You know, he gets him behind his iron shield. All the while, Wiglaf's giving Beowulf encouragement, just talking about, you are the best. You're the strongest. You can do it. <laughs> You kick ass. <laughs> but it works. And Beowulf kind of gets psyched up again. You need a cheerleader. Exactly. This character is so important as part of the epic tale. So you ever I- notice how similar that is, like the death of Arthur? You know, when the only knight by him at the end is Sir Bevedere. You have your best friend near you at the end. He's like, all right, I'm going to get him. So he goes and uh, freaking stabs him with the sword. But this time the sword flipping breaks. And this is a problem with Beowulf. And he, he knows this. He goes, because he's so flipping superhumanly strong, that swords just break like toothpicks for him. And he gets bit. Right on the neck. The dragon does a clamp down. Doesn't kill him. Just bites him. And Wheelof goes, you're super strong. Oh, no, you're not so super strong. So he, <laughs> he jumps up. He stabs the dragon in the belly while this is going on, which hurts it. Beowulf says, ah, I got a chance here. Pulls out a knife, stabs it in the side. Both of them are working on it. Boom, dragon goes down. Dead. But Beowulf, he's like, I feel like I got a temperature or something. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's having Wheelof feel his forehead. And he says, yeah, oh, no. My blood sugar's down. I don't know what's going on here. He's a candy bar. He still feels bad. <laughs> he realizes the bite was venomous. Oh. Um, so he's going to die, and he's going to die pretty quick. Yeah. Wheelof tends to his wound, but it's not helping. He's going down. Beowulf says, ah, you know, I always wanted a, a son to give my armor to when I died, but I, I, I never had children. Yeah. I mean, he really knows this is, I'm going out. He feels he's been a strong and fair king and that God will take him into the afterlife. And then he asks... <laughs> this is the craziest, but this is what he wants. This is his last wish. He goes, mm-hmm. Wheelof, I want you to go into that barrow. Get me some treasure to look at before I die. <laughs> it's like, what? Yeah, I just want you to bring some tre- I just want to look at it. I just want to love it. I love it so much. I got to look at this treasure. <laughs> and Wheelof goes, yeah, you got it, dude. And he go- runs in, gets some. There's this glowing standard that's in there, mm-hmm. you know, like a, a big thing on a pole. And it's yeah, yeah. really exciting. 
he takes that out too. Beowulf gets his last glance at the treasure, just like he wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, he orders Wheelof to build a barrow for him on the coast after his body has been burned on the funeral pyre. He wants ships to see it and just be reminded of his great deeds. You know, I'll probably do something similar. <laughs> Beowulf gives his golden collar to Wheelof and says, you know, you're the last of my clan. Take this. I really appreciate you, buddy. Thank you for being a friend. Beowulf dies. The cowards come back and they see Wheelof and the dead Beowulf and they're all ashamed. They feel really yeah. bad. And Wheeloff chews him out big time. He just is like, you guys suck. <laughs> You're the worst. Yeah, Beowulf wouldn't be dead if we'd all teamed up. Yeah, and you know how good he was to you and your families and your people mm -hmm. and all the things he's done for you. And you just run away when the chips are down. You guys stink and they feel bad. And they should because, you know, now that Beowulf is dead, that means bad times for them. Exactly. Because once the word gets out that Beowulf is gone, all their enemies are going to know that they're weak now because they had a superhero ruling right. them. And now the superhero is gone. So it's time to wreck stuff. And everybody agrees with it. They're like, oh, yeah. And as far as we know, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Bad times are coming. That's not where the story ends. Beowulf, they do what he said. They put him on the pyre. Then they make a barrow. They take a bunch of gold on the pyre with him. And that melts. He gets to go down with his treasure. You can take it with you if you're Beowulf. <laughs> <laughs> it takes 10 days to build that barrow. It can be seen from the sea. And, and there's just this massive funeral celebration that ends the poem. Then round the mound rode the battle-brave men, offspring of noblemen, twelve in all. They wished to voice their cares and mourn their king, utter sad songs and speak of that man. They praised his lordship and his proud deeds, judged well his prowess. As it is proper that one should praise his lord with words, should love him in his heart when the fatal hour comes, when he must from his body be led forth. So the men of the Geats lamented the fall of their prince, the hearth companions. They said that he was of all the kings of the world the mildest of men and the most gentle, the kindest to his folk, and the most eager for fame. Of all of his fighting and his superhero powers and his kick-assery, mm -hmm. what is important about Beowulf is that he was a good guy. Yeah. And now in the bit, it says most eager for fame. I was reading some different translations of this, and they talk about that it's not really fame so much as reputation and reputation for being a good person. Yes. That's what was important to him. Not only did he want to be good, but he wanted to be recognized for the fact that he was a good person. That's kind of the message of this poem. It's pretty great. Yeah, and it still holds up. And Beowulf is not... We talk about him a lot as being a character, but um, Beowulf and all of these people aren't necessarily characters as much as they are representations of certain values, which may be why they have very inhuman characteristics. Right. I'm curious, what translation did you read? Because I read this uh, actually a couple of months ago. I read the Seamus Heaney translation, yes. which is fairly new, but quickly becoming canon. I think it might be the one in the Norton anthologies now. Wow. I liked it a lot. Yeah, I read that one as well. Dr. Bat recommended that I read the R.M. Liuza. I think that's how mm -hmm. it's pronounced. I'm not exactly sure. It's really good. There's slight differences, but, you know, basically it's it's all the same. And there's some other translations that are online that you can read for free that are 100 years old. It would be good to read a couple of the translations if you like Beowulf. I know that the Seamus Heaney translation is very Irish. It has his Irish poetry to it. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the Tolkien translation, which has just been released recently, might be perhaps a bit more Teutonic sounding and there are subtle differences between all of them, but I think we didn't really want to get into the weeds on that too much. That could probably be its own show. One of the things that's really crazy about this is the fact that it was Old English. This is the longest Old English poem in, in existence. And it's crazy. It's unrecognizable. I don't understand how they can even get away with calling it English at all. Because <laughs> when I when I read the Heaney version, I had a book that had the Old English on one page and the translation on the other yeah. page. So while I was reading, I could look over at what the words used to be and... Made no sense to no, me. No, it doesn't make any connection. sense. How that ended up being a modern English is insane. <laughs> it, I is. Can't it really is. Make I know, I've, seen it, I've seen it myself, you know, the, 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 the scraps of it. You could barely, well, even in the way they formed the letters and stuff. But in the Haney one, you could actually, you know, pronounce out the words, I think, a little bit, if I remember right. But You can try. Yeah, you can try. <laughs> <laughs> and fortunately, we've got Dr. Bat, who can read Old English, giving us the beginning of the story. What? Wegardena in ya dagum, Theodukuninga thrun ya frunnon, Ho the Athlingers Ellen Fremedon, Of the children shafing, Sheathena threatum, Monego marthum, Meodo settler of ta. Egso de Eolas, so than arst wear the fair shaft funden. He thus frofra ye bad, Wax undo walknum. Wyodd mundum tha o ddad him allwylg tha'r o umsitendra o fy 
hohen Rader Hurenschulder, Gumban Gulden. That was God Koenig. You know Esperanto? Esperanto, you mm -hmm. know that the the fictional I've heard language. Of, yeah, that's that made up language. Yeah. Well, the whole point, the the reason the guy made it, because it's it's a Latin derivative, mm -hmm. um, like in like Spanish or whatever. But it's supposed to be really simple to learn, and the rules are supposed to be really simple. And uh, you know, um, Shatner did a movie, William Shatner, yeah. uh, called Succubus. Was it Incubus? Incubus. 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 Yeah. And it's all in Esperanto. It's all because the the Esperanto Association or whatever funded the movie. Because they were trying to get the language to be more popular. Oh, that would be really funny to see. <laughs> oh, it's available on DVD. You can get William it. William Shatner talking in Esperanto. The whole movie. It's pretty weird. It's black and white, and it's uh, got a, and a goat attack in there, which is yeah, really funny. A, yeah, that's all I remember from it is there was a dangerous goat attack at one point. <laughs> oh, goats, of course. But the thing about <laughs> Esperanto now is that it's it is spoken more because of the internet than it has ever been spoken there's something like uh like 10 million esperanto speakers now Be wow. because what? yeah what because it's it's this neutral language that people are willing to learn and speak well, so yeah, think if we if we if we if we, we held the mid east peace talks in esperanto you know and then maybe everybody <laughs> could agree you know <laughs> we we did 5000 years of fighting and stuff that's it. that's <laughs> That's what they we need, need to, to do. send Shatner over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, it's, it's so, five year mission could be <laughs> <laughs> bring peace to the Middle East. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're doing some, uh, we're digressing a bit from the topic. I was actually, when I read Beowulf, there's also, it's told in these well, I don't three. Oh, William parts. Shatner, Beowulf, you know, the lead character in, in, in Star Trek. Beowulf traveled, he had to travel to, and as a matter of fact, he even says that later on in the story that it's good to travel to go get fame. Because remember, he wasn't inheriting the kingdom in his own country. He had to go to the Hrothgar's country so he could get honor and glory. And traveling to go get that, that's, you know, that's a big part of the, the whole mythic, epic tradition you know and you mentioned earlier that you when you were teaching this you're making connections to harry potter and you offhandedly said you don't know what the importance of that is but i i would guess that that is one of the most important things to do with beowulf is make these connections to star trek or harry potter or whatever it is oh, yeah, so that yeah, people yeah. can see here we have um the same dramatic elements going on that, that was one of my main goals i guess when i was teaching you know is to try and point out these archetypes you know that were there that you can see in every story that even starts now because they're they're deep within all of us that's what the whole Jungian idea of the archetype is it's part of all of our makeup and and it may say something about what we really are which i think is the most important thing to try to learn about i guess what is this thing called man you know any literature worthy of a name is something that you can reread. So obviously a poem like Beowulf, you're going to grow with it. And perhaps a 60 year old is going to read something like the famously extrapolated Lay of the Last Survivor, which Seamus Heaney used um, that part of the poem about loss and, and grief and is the isolation produced by death that Seamus Heaney offered as a kind of tribute to his friend at the death of Ted Hughes. That kind of thing perhaps has a resonance with a 60-year-old that it might not have for someone who's 14. But I think what's really interesting for a teenager reading Beowulf is that sense of things going wrong. Um, you know, when, when you're growing up, you want to kind of find your own place in the world. And here we've got a poem that is ostensibly about a hero who knows his own place in the world, the stability of which is hard earned, if you like. You know that you don't, you know, it isn't automatically obvious that Beowulf is always going to be triumphant and of course at the end he isn't triumphant death catches up with him and these big questions that you do wrestle with I think especially because you don't have life experience in your teens things like death and transience and what you do in time. I think those questions are appealing to a teenager. The reverence for Beowulf as a as a piece of formative literature in the English language is actually fairly recent, isn't it? I, I think for a long time it was relegated. I mean, people didn't actually have a huge appreciation for this you, story. I have these old textbooks, and the further back you go, they start English literature with Chaucer, not with mm -hmm. Beowulf. But, but as you get in newer and newer in, in, into the 20th century, after 1930s and 40s, then you start with Beowulf. 
Yeah. I just kind of made a collection of, you know, nobody else seemed to want all these old textbooks. I don't know. They kept throwing them out. So I kept ending up with them. And now when I retired, I brought them home a lot. I just find it interesting to see how these things progress. You know, that's a quote by C.S. Lewis, I think, about reading old books. You know, when you read an old book, you see, you let the sea breeze of the past blow through your mind. Instead of just hearing about it or something like that, you're actually reading the words written down by somebody back in whatever time it was that they wrote that book. And it gives you a different perspective on things like traveling, you know, except time traveling. This was the theme through both of our conversations, relating Beowulf to a modern, younger audience. All great thoughts. And I do think that Beowulf is definitely something that people of any age can still find interesting things in and that uh, should still be taught in in high schools and college. I think so. That's as much as we've got to say about it for this show. Uh, It was a little different than our usual structure, hopefully enjoyable for you. And I want to thank again everybody who helped us with our Kickstarter. Oh, thank you guys uh, so much. That this was a reward for, and we hope you'll help us again as we do both Providence and Chicago in this year, 2015. Extra special thanks to our guests. Thank you so much, Mr. Bob Hansky, for taking the time to talk with us and uh, be included on our show. And thank you to Dr. Bat for taking the time as well. She was a delight to talk to and had so many interesting things to say. I mean, we talked for over an hour about this and uh, yeah. I almost wish I could include all of it. Well, you can't. <laughs> also want to thank Andrew Lehman again for lending his voice to us. As always, uh, a pleasure to have him reading. And I love Reber Clark's music and feel so privileged to be able to have it on our show. Thank you so much, Reber. And uh, that is all we have for this show, this very special episode of the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast. I am Chris Lackey. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. Thank you for tuning in to hppodcraft.com. hppodcraft.com Thank you.